We're on. All right, so we're going to start with some public hearings as a continuation of the public hearings from the last meeting, uh, number one and number two. The first is the amend the proposed amendment of the local law number two, amending the zoning law of the mixed use waterfront. Um, we did make a couple changes to it. I want to discuss. Um, they're fairly simple in section C. Uses requiring a special permit pursuant to section 250 tech 32 and 33 shall be as follows. And this is the list of potential uses. We added two on here. One is arts and education. The second is light industry. And then we follow in section F, which is the definitions, to define light industry. It is defined as a facility which manufactures, designs, assembles, or processes a product for wholesale or retail within a fully enclosed building and which does not result in the generation of more than 10 vehicle traffic trips per day or potentially dangerous, offensive or hazardous materials or wastes or utilize a process which is dangerous, polluting or incompatible with other uses of the district. Those are the additions that came out of last week's meeting. Now, I wanna go back quickly here and find where I've got it, bear with me. to the comprehensive plan. <clears throat> and what comes out of the comprehensive plan, section A6 recommendations, so it's recommendation A6. We want update land usage regulations to be consistent with this plan. Of special importance is to update local regulations so that they prioritize and allow for small and non-industrial businesses that are water dependent and waterfront related. The waterfront should also allow for use of mixed use bills of commercial that house both commercial and residential. What I wanted to point out there is it the, the comprehensive plan specifically calls out non industrial. So I wanted to throw that out there for discussion with the team here uh, for, for open public forum. I, I will tell you my inclination would be to not include light industry. Based on what, based on the instructions that we get from the comprehensive plan. Feedback. Don't forget to come off mute. This is a public hearing, so anyone can speak up. Uh, if we start getting several, we'll go back to the raise the hand, either literally raise your hand or virtually raise your hand in the uh, in Zoom, and that'll let me know you want to talk. Otherwise. Uh, uh, can I just ask if there's a definition for what qualifies as light industrial? I mean, is that, you know, like at what point does a craftsperson, maybe with like a, some kind of a shop, all of a sudden be qualified as light industrial? Well, that's what I just read. It's uh, defined a uh, facility which manufactures, designs, assembles, or processes a product for wholesale or retail within a fully enclosed building and which does not result in the generation of more than 10 vehicle traffic trips per day or potentially dangerous, offensive, or hazardous materials, or wastes, or utilize a process which is dangerous, polluting, or incompatible with other uses of the district. So if it meets any of those criteria, it would be excluded from the waterfront area. That's right. It would not be eligible for a special permit in mixed use waterfront, yes. Wait. No, this allows for light industry now. You know, what he's saying is anything that I read, in other words, anything that falls with outside of this, which is really, a, it provides what it cannot do. It cannot generate more than 10 vehicle traffic trips per day. It must be fully enclosed. It cannot, put the, so if it has more than 10, if it's not fully enclosed, if it uh, has potentially dangerous hazardous materials, et cetera, then it is excluded. It is not considered light industrial for this definition. Stefan, yeah. oh. can I can I say something? Um, I just uh, it, I, it's a little confusing, and I, I think it might be helpful if uh, if I'm going to just take a little stab at explaining the process here, um, which is it looks as if you've incorporated into this draft law all of the suggestions that came up last time. And the plan now is to discuss them all again, one more time, and then decide on the final law. So the final law 
could include all of the changes that you've put in or just some of the changes. Is that right? So, so this light industry, which people have been asking about, this is a proposed inclusion in the new law that could be excluded completely or the definition could be modified yet again, if people aren't happy with it. Um, and same with arts and education, that could be excluded completely or it could end up being included. So to tonight, if there seems to be a consensus, the board will end up uh, passing the resolution with, with or without certain changes. But if there's still uncertainty or significant changes, then this would have to be continued one more time mm -hmm. to the next meeting when it would be one more public hearing in the same way as the changes that were proposed last time that are now appearing in a new version of the bill were enough different to require a continuation of the public hearing from last time to this time. I have a question. Sure, Nance. Um, in the event somebody gets a special permit for light industry and they exceed 10 vehicles, what were to happen? Is that a fine or? Would you wanna? Yeah, that's, they, they basically are, are cited by um, the code enforcement officer to um, cease and desist the violation. And if they don't, then yeah, they get fined. We have to go to court. Potentially we could pull their special use permit and shut them down. Okay, thank you. And yeah. Stefan, can I say one other thing, which is I believe a moment ago you read from the comprehensive plan and, and you noted that it actually does not include light industry typically asks to remove industry. Yeah, so by putting this back in here as a proposal to the group to consider, we're now going against what the comprehensive plan process um, recommended based on input at the last uh, board meeting. So- Well, I think, sorry, Josh, I think that we're sticking with the spirit of it you know, I think the intent was to get rid of um, large polluting industry, but you know, if someone wants to uh, design and 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 silkscreen T-shirts in a facility near the in the mixed-use waterfront, I, I, you know, I, I think that's probably okay. That kind of thing. It's not uh, C and D processing facility. And I think one of the one of the comments that during the public hearing last time was that you know there had been a long time business down on the waterfront where they manufactured boats and it wasn't really a large scale operation but it was certainly a light in industrial use and why would we want to effectively zone out something like that that has a long history here in the village i agree with that uh and i i would just right. wanted to make sure that that was inclusive enough because exactly if you have somebody that's you know maybe renting kayaks and they have a repair shop associated with it you want to make sure there's there's carve outs for those kind of businesses right well that would be included i think in the waterfront access there are allowances for waterfront businesses uh, retail store oriented for waterfront activities designed primarily to need, serve the needs of pedestrian and visitors service businesses oriented uh, to <clears throat> waterfront related activities. So yeah, you could draw a line there, I think, you know, depending on how large you go with repair, et cetera, between a, a water related small business and a light industry. So. Um, but, sorry, go ahead, Stefan. Oh, go ahead, oh, I just was gonna say, um, having been part of the comprehensive plan committee, I don't really recall us um, getting sort of into like the definitions of what light industry is versus, uh, you know, anything greater than light industry. Um, so, I mean, I, uh, I think based on the definition that you provided, I mean, I think it would, you know, I don't think it would be, I think it would be a positive thing to allow light industry businesses to, um, to operate here. 
Yeah. So um, I just wanted to kind of second um, what Anna, Annika said. And I think that as you describe it, um, I don't find it prohibitive. And I'm glad to find, to hear that there was the adjustment around arts and education. That was very important. And I'm glad that was really heard last time. And I think, I think basically, um, I, I'm glad that Matt brought up about the example of the kayaks. Um, yes, that falls into the already kind of ordained waterfront activity that is there. But in regards to, you know, a repair shop, that all seems kind of, seems to fall within uh, what you now describe as light industry. I think probably there wouldn't be a, a hard time defining something that exceeds light industry. And as long as um, that light industry falls within those parameters that you stated, I think it's reasonably flexible and, um, and the improvements are, are really, really good over the last, the first round. So two cents there. Um, I noticed something that was brought up at the last meeting. Um, I think Molly brought it up. She's not on this call, but um, letter E um, still says, shall provide for some form of water related recreation use as an accessory use on the site. Um, does that sort of pigeonhole us into I don't think it does. And that's, I mean, this, that's not new. That's been in here. Yeah, that's I know. I, I thought we should discuss making a tweak yeah. to it. So I'm not making it shall, but I think it, this gets into just allowing people to access the water from your backyard, right? Allowing them to, to, to walk behind the business and put your feet in the water kind of constitutes what you need for that, which is, which is, I think, uh, compatible with what's in the, the local waterfront revitalization plan as well. So it doesn't really stipulate how much need there is, but it kind of forces that you're going to, you know, you have to have a path for people to get to the water through your property, things like that, which is what I believe this is trying to get at. So I, I would personally, it's, it's vague enough that I would recommend we leave that in there because it allows us to ensure that we can force people to put a path to allow people to the water, to get water access, et cetera. But I'm, I'm open to more. That was my thought. I'm, I'm open to more inputs on that. No, I just wanted to bring it up because Molly um, had mentioned it and yep. she's not she's not here to bring it up again. I just had it in my notes from the last meeting. So, and I know we had said something about tweaking it. So yeah. I think what Molly said was that she was concerned that any new business that fit all the other parameters that the mayor just went through, that unless it had a specific relationship to the water, it would not be able to get a special permit. She was afraid about the specificity of that. But it doesn't, if you read it, right, it doesn't mean that it has to be a... Could everyone who's not Could speaking mute? Everyone who's not speaking mute. Thank you. Thank you. What it says is that you have to provide for some provide for some recreation. recreation. As an accessory as to an accessory to yeah. Meryl, can you uh, can you mute? Thank you. There we go. Does that make sense? You understand what I'm saying with that? So it doesn't it doesn't necessitate that the business be a water dependent business. It necessitates that they allow some form of water related activity as an accessory use to the site. In other words, have a path to allow people access to the water, something like that. Let people launch kayaks from your backyard, whatever it may be. You're getting the thumbs up. Okay. <laughs> Quadruple thumbs up. Um, just, I uh, just a question off of that. I mean, does that then open up a potential liability issue for these businesses? I was going to say the same thing, Annika. That's a good point. Yeah. I mean, um, you know, what if somebody walks on their property and slips and falls and, you know, is injured or worse. Um, I mean, if I were a business owner, I would be really concerned about that. 
because I would think the liability would potentially then fall on me if I'm if I own the land or if I'm leasing the land for my for my business. And I think that came up when uh, when everyone was out on the ice a few, uh, I guess that was a month or so ago, right? Yeah, good point. Well, how have we handled that in the past? Well, it, it has not been an issue um, thus far, but it certainly could be just because no one is sued because of an injury or hasn't been injured um, doesn't mean it's not going to happen. And the fact is, though, that even if you exclude people, even if you put up posted signs and say you're not allowed on here, if, if there is a dangerous condition existing on your property, and you know it exists and you know that people are trespassing and they get hurt as a result of that dangerous condition, you're going to be on the hook for it. Um, so the, the fact is, keep your property safe. I, may I speak or someone else wanted to speak? Um, I uh, have some concerns about that as well, because um, there are all sorts of things that people will come up with. Um, this, this has residences, offices, uh, service businesses, arts and education, light industry. And so you may have somebody who wants to open, I don't know, a small dental practice, uh, which would be compatible or, or really almost anything. And they may not want people walking across their property. And even if we require it, um, uh, is it just going to be a path to the water? I mean, what, what, what value is that? Why would someone just want to walk from the front of your property to the back of your property to just, uh, you know, look at the water? Why, you know, if it, well, I, I would, I would say that the, the, the mayor was just using that as an example of one of the many different things you could do. If I were going to open up say my law practice on the waterfront there, because you could do it as under professional or, um, other business office. All right, um, I'll sell some sunscreen. That's that's water use related. You know, I'll sell a couple of hats or some flippers. That's, if that's what it takes to get me in the door so that I can have my office down by the river. I'll do that. Uh, well, that's wonderful, but it's kind of bizarre. I mean, <laughs> what are you going to, I mean, who, 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 who you, this would be like your legal clients when they walk in your office, they would see that you're selling flippers and sunscreen and a hat. I mean, it's just, I think <laughs> an example, again, it's, it's just an, an example. I mean, slap a, slap a make little anything arm. sound ridiculous, but. So tell when we did, when the individual built the property next door to the uh, wastewater treatment plant. He was required to keep a path down to the water as, prob as part of that, probably was before my time, but there was a requirement that he keep a path uh, to allow water access to the public uh, as part of the getting his special permit to do a residential there. Well, and I think that was, I think that was his idea, part of his application, because that was the way that he could meet this particular requirement in the law. Um, I don't, it, it, it certainly, it doesn't say that, that you have to have a path to the water. That's just, that was his solution to this particular requirement. Well, but, but, but I don't know that, I mean, to use your example, Tal, of selling items, um, this says all uses, it doesn't say she'll have some sort of water related activity. It says water related recreation use. It, it just seems to me that it's kind of a leftover piece of language from an earlier version of this law that um, doesn't really make sense the more we talk about it. I mean, I haven't really, I think it's easy to envision like realistic uses, you know, someone said a kayak repair or whatever, you know, you could repair rent kayaks and then just launch them off the back. So it's easy to conceive of, um, uh, ways that this would fit or someone wants to build a small apartment building and allow both its residents and the public to have, you know, sit at benches and look out at the water. So that's, it's not a problem thinking of things that could fit, 
but it just, my question is, are there not many things that uh, would be excluded or where you're trying to force a, um, a square peg into a round hole like research and development facility? Uh, they may, there are businesses that have proprietary processes or may want to store things uh, in the back of their property and you know, are, would be concerned about public coming and going at all hours. I mean, yeah. I- Sorry, Josh, go ahead. Go ahead. I just was gonna say, I mean, I keep coming back to like the liability concern. Um, as a business owner, I mean, I do have general liability insurance. Um, and if I were looking to potentially, again, like rent or buy space on the water, if I found this out that this was a requirement, I mean, it would really deter me from from wanting to move forward with that purchase or lease. Um, and Josh, I think you made a good point. Like, you know, people will find easily find reasons to to uh, you know create lawsuits out of nothing. I mean, and just because it hasn't happened in the history of Athens doesn't mean that it isn't going to happen. I think, I think Stefan, you yourself suggested a compromise language that might make more sense, which is instead of shall, which is a requirement, um, you might want to change it to should, which um, kind of encourages it. And then that gives the power to the planning board when they're reviewing it to ask the applicant, well, the law says uh, you should make some sort of access available have you thought about that? Could you do this? Could you do that? And to have a kind of an interactive conversation with the applicant uh, and even ultimately kind of require it saying, you know, we think you could do this. You're going to be a kayak company. You're, uh, you know, the, the bank uh, behind you is close to the water. You're going to be uh, renting and uh, repairing kayaks. Why don't you have a launch in the back there? Whereas if someone is opening a law practice, you know, and doesn't just doesn't want to put money into developing the the back of their yard where the river is, um, w w you know, could explain that to the planning board, and the planning board could say, yeah, in your case, it doesn't make sense. Plus, two doors down, there is access anyway. So, you know, they could look at it in the context of the entire. Uh, repertoire of access or, or portfolio of accesses that there are along the, the waterfront. Yeah, that's what we had discussed at the last meeting, um, was changing shall to should. I think it was that simple. Because um, what's the intent? The intent is not to bar people from getting to the water, but not necessarily that everybody has to have you know, a, a dock off of the back of their business or whatever for people to jump in and go swimming. Susan? I mean, since the point of all of the whole comp plan and everything else has been to encourage, you know, great business and healthy, you know, recreation and all that at the water, then you're, you're sort of imposing something on people coming in and having innovative businesses and yet the pre-existing businesses, does that fall upon them too? I mean, there are businesses and industries on the waterfront now that would never let you have that access through their property. So it seems like now we're creating a more healthy environment, quote unquote, and now this sort of restriction or, or condition is imposed on those businesses. And in, 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 a, with, in relation to Molly, I mean, there's a property next door where they had the skating, I mean, the ice boating thing this winter. And that woman, you know, had to post it. She was happy to do it, but then posted it. So does that leave it then to Molly's, Molly to have to have the access? I don't know. Does, is it as simple as taking out shall and putting in should tell? That would definitely be one way to do it. Um, the, the only problem is that we're, this is just something that we're discussing now at a very superficial almost level. And I think that the main point of doing this law was 
at this time was kind of a stopgap so that we could get the moratorium off the books and get the, the waterfront and the mixed use back open for business. Because certainly there's going to be, you know, the, the comprehensive plan implementation committee that does whatever it is that they do with the entire zoning review. And that would lend itself to a much more in-depth review of all of these issues, okay. as opposed to just kind of the pointed reason why we're looking at this one section in the law to get that moratorium gone so that we can move ahead. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm inclined to you know I, uh, you know that that clause resulted in you know Peckham having the half acre or so of space on South Street where they let people fish and use the water right and and it, I'd love to see something with the Elko plant where where as that opens up that we have some use there as well I you know if you're talking about a small law firm it's fairly low impact, but once you put a should in there, it makes it optional for big business and small business. So I, I guess I'm with Tal. I, I think this is a revisit and it's a revisit with the local water uh, local waterfront revitalization committee to talk to them about how this should be worded. Um, Cause there are good things that come out of that shell. And there are reasons that that shell is in there. I understand the, the, uh, the other side of it. Uh, but I, I'd like to try to move forward with what we had and then come back and revisit this at a later time. Dead silence. I was trying to unmute myself, but I accidentally muted someone else because somebody came in from the, <laughs> the list moved around. One, one thought, Step, and you might... <clears throat> to, to give you um, the uh, kind of encouragement or reinforcement you need to move is uh, your board, the board could vote on that, this particular issue since it seems like there's some talk back and forth. And if people say yes, for the reasons that you and Tal mentioned, the five of you agree that it should stay in, then it kind of, that stays in and then you can vote on the full, um, it's just a, a procedural suggestion. Say that one more time, Josh. Um, well, Tal can tell me if I'm correct in this procedural recommendation, but if there are areas where it, there, it isn't clear what the sense of the board is, such as this one, or, and it may be clear, so it, this may not apply, but if it isn't clear, you could vote on whether to include D as is or change it to should. And then once that's established, then you could have a vote on the full uh resolution or, or or skip it i'm just making a, a procedural suggestion you can skip that if you'd rather not do it you can just go when the con when if if when i finish speaking it stays quiet you can take your vote on the whole thing as is my recommendation would be to come back to the shall versus should argument once we've brought the the lwrp l yeah you know what i mean uh committee well, the, the Waterfront water Advisory yeah. Committee. To bring them into that as well to make sure they don't have any inputs on it. Well, I'm not hearing your board members disagree with you, so. I don't disagree. Okay. No. So we'll couch the shall should conversation and come back to that. And when I say we, I mean Amy. Um, and so let's come back to the original. Uh, are there any other comments on the arts education, light industry, and the definition of light industry as we've stated them in, in the current document? Go ahead, Bob. Bob. So we're just leaving it up the planning, to the planning board to make that interpretation, what light industry means. Well, we, we provided the definition of it, so it's got to mm -hmm. be compliant with the definition. And no, the answer to that directly is no. Um, planning board doesn't have interpretive powers like that. They look at it and they, they will receive an application from the code enforcement officer. Everything goes to the code enforcement officer first. He makes the determination that yes, this fits that definition and then refers it to the planning board for the site plan review and the special use permit. Mm -hmm. 
or he says, no, it doesn't fit, and that's the end of it. And anybody who doesn't like either one of those decisions can appeal it to the Zoning Board of Appeals. They have the interpretive powers and can say, oh, yeah, it does fit, or no, we agree with the code enforcement officer, or you know, whatever it is that, that is the determination to be made. Okay. And then the planning board then picks up the reins again and does the review based on the interpretations. Any other comments? I just, I just don't like the idea of going down to the river on people's property. Because like that woman said, you're open for a hell of a lot of lawsuits. Somebody gets hurt. Well, I think the, the board will come back to that one, Ricky. That's, that's, that's not a change. That's always been there. So I just want to bring the, the Waterfront Advisory Committee in and discuss it with them. And, and uh, that can be revisited at a future time. I don't disagree with you. I just want to make sure that we understand why it's there and what impacts it's had in the past. Okay. Any other comments on what was this public hearing number one for local law number two? Don't forget to come off mute. Any other comments for local law, number, local law number two? Okay, thanks everybody. Good discussion. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Next one is the, and I apologize, my printer's going out on me, so I got to go back to my uh, hard copies here. It's the repeal. Um, Yeah, just All to repeal right. their the local law number three to repeal the six month moratorium on special use permits. So I will open that up for comment. Don't forget to come off mute if you have a comment on local law number three repealing the six month moratorium. There we go. I thought you were trying to come off mute. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I'm moving from this side of the room. Um, my understanding is that if we passed what we just spoke about, there is no longer a need to maintain that. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. That's what I thought. I just wanted to say it out loud in case anyone had missed that conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, the moratorium was put in place pending findings from the Comprehensive Planning Committee, and then pending application of any changes to the zoning, applicable changes to the zoning. Thank you. Okay, any other comments on local law number three? All right. With that, I will close the public hearing section. Um, we are going to talk more about the review of the parking law on North Franklin Street. We had talked about this one a while back. Uh, it had come up oh geez, months ago. I think Gail proposed it. Uh, we reviewed it. We got into a uh, significant discussion, though no changes were made, which is why it's not technically uh, a public hearing today. Um, but we, you know, I will open it up after we after the board discusses it. I will open it up if there are additional comments. Um, the only real concern that came out of it as far as, you know, review or, or uh, proposals was around speeding um, and the concern over the impact it would have on speeding. So we did do a study. It took us a while. I apologize. Uh, but our uh, speed sign was down for quite a while. Uh, the net of it is, let me get to the meat of this here. Over a 20 day period, a little over 4,700 cars. Uh, generally during peak hours, uh, it averages between six and nine cars an hour on North Franklin Street coming and going. Um, of the 4,705, 
96 percent 95 to 96 percent were under the speed limit um and uh, between one and two percent were what are considered excessive which is over 40 miles an hour and in those cases it averaged 41 40 40.7 um so we saw about one to two percent at 40 miles an hour 96 percent 95 percent under the speed limit and then the other two to three percent uh between 25 and 40 miles an hour so that was the net of the the speeding um so i throw that out there you know the concern and and i i do believe this uh that as you make a street wider essentially or or more accessible uh that it does tend to bring the speed up on that street um so the concern was if we already have a problem with speeding will this exacerbate it um so the net of it is we don't seem to have a problem with speeding uh overall law of big numbers uh there's not an overall speeding problem on north franklin street um so i i want to detach that conversation a little bit and come back to the parking conversation, which let me find it really quickly here. Before you move off the speeding part, though, can you just uh, clarify what, what was the time period for the survey? Was this like two weeks? Was this a month? Was this, you know, is, is it representative of the full year? 20 day period. Sorry, say again? 20 days. Okay. Well, let me pull this up here. And also the the speeding meter itself can be a deterrent for speeding. As you go down it, you see the big glowing numbers, so you're gonna slow down. Yep, <laughs> agreed. Okay. So local law to amend and modify the Village of Athens traffic law. Uh, it's changes um, section 220 tech 13 amended to include the following language. North Franklin Street, west side, so this is the no parking sec section of the law. North Franklin Street, west side from Market Street in the southerly direction to the firehouse. Hmm. How disappointing. So, um, can I talk? I uh, went and drove up and down North Franklin Street a few times today and I actually went across Market and I was coming back from the north side and I stopped at the stop sign and just sort of watched. And um, there was just a regular sedan and it was so tight getting through with the, the whole, both sides of the street were fully parked up. And it just looked as if even that sedan was having a hard time getting through with all of those cars parked there. And the whole thing kind of began, it, not kind of, it began as a safety concern. Um, I don't, you know, I, I was trying to figure out how little change we could make, um, you know, not necessarily all the way to the firehouse with the no parking, because I do know, I do understand that there's several residents there that have no off street parking. Um, and I wanted to actually ask, I see Wayne is on, so I wanted to talk to the, our fire chief again um, about how small i actually got on google earth to try and look at it from above too how short of a of a no parking zone we need in order for the fire trucks and and dpw trucks as well to be able to get through safely um, i was thinking if it began just south like like number 40 which isn't there is no number 40 right it's from 38 to 42 um but in that zone there perhaps that is a good enough spot. That's sort of where the road gets narrower. So that was just a thought I had, and I wanted to put it out there and see what the what what you have to say, Wayne, as far as getting those trucks through there. You drive all the all the big vehicles in the in the village. Yeah, um, I mean, I'm just going to reference the the red brick house right about that area is when it does start getting really tight. So you know, not just like I said, the fire trucks, you know. That you know, when I have to plow that route, it gets tight too. You know, I get you know, gets really tight with trying to push the snow through there. Right house on the east side of the road, down the hill from the firehouse, essentially, right? From yeah. The... Okay.
other inputs from the board. Ricky, you're muted if you're if you're talking. There you go. Uh, I think that's the way, way to do it. One side, east side park. People got driveway, they can use them to be on the safety side. That's the way to go from the fire out down to uh, market. That's the only way I could see to solve the problem. Other board members? I think we might be able to make some exceptions for further on down the hill. Further on up the hill or? Down uh, towards Market Street, right, Gail? Yeah. Hmm? Because the road does narrow. You said. Yeah, what we had discussed a while ago, if I recall, is the reason we kept it at the top of the hill at the firehouse was it is a blind hill. No, man. Yes. So from a, we talked about that uh, as a as another safety concern uh, that it, we're narrowing on on what is essentially a blind hill. I'm just trying to look at who has. <laughs> though, though, Stefan, it, it's a blind hill. The idea being that if you're coming from the south and you come up over the hill and you come down, if you, uh, I mean, my thought was, I'm hearing some people suggest this also, that in, instead of a full half a block from Market Street to the firehouse, you do a quarter of a block, like halfway in between where Amy is talking about starting down to Market Street. And the blind part is when you're coming up, well, coming in either direction, but the part where you don't see is where you're coming up from the south. If you crest over and there's still parking on the left side, you're still driving cautiously. So if the parking is not allowed from then halfway down that hill to Market Street, then you're seeing that when you're coming uh, up over the hill. Wayne, when you refer to the brick house, you, you're talking about the firehouse? No, no, halfway up the road. I okay. believe it's the third house in from Market Street on the right. 33. Yeah, that'd be mine. It's 38. Yeah. Eight? On the east side, we said, right? We would have, the parking would be prohibited on the west side. No. We yes. would be allowed to park on the east side. Yes. So the, the, the even side of the street would have prohibited parking. Right, but I the way I understood it, just so we have it right, Wayne was describing a house on the east side of the road, the brick house on the east side of the road. Oh, okay. Which I interpreted to be 33 North Franklin. I think you meant the west side, didn't you? Yes, uh, I did, west side. West side, okay. So it might that. be helpful to have a map that you could share screen so people could um, yeah. see. I have Google Earth up. Yeah, but... Should I should I screen share it? Yeah, you it does appear to be a lot of group confusion now as to uh, specifically what what we're talking. Just go from there, then go to the top hill. Then it's more where it's it's like where the red brick house and the next two walk is where it starts. That's where I want to go to Brady's. Not all the way. Up. seeing this? Freaky. Can you mute for a yeah. minute? Did I do it? Did I screen share correctly? Yes, Amy, this is very helpful. Yeah, I did it. And, and and you've identified the building. This is where I was. Yeah, this is what mm -hmm. I was thinking. Um, and, and you I can actually this. see how you know right about where that white car is. You can actually see where the road starts getting narrow. Mm -hmm. Right, you know, you got thirty-eight, and then that white car crossing thirty-eight. Right there, you can sort of see where the the road starts really getting narrow. Well, it could be from the southern property line of 38 North Franklin mm -hmm. on the west side of North Franklin north to Market Street. That's what I was thinking. Just, you know, we can, I don't know how hard it is to try it that way. And then if it's not working, extend it. But I know that it's a hardship for people who don't have off street parking. And you know the lot is up the street, but it's a little ways. 
And I guess the issue with off street parking, I apologize right, if yeah. I was not on the board, but uh, is that we also have to get a permit in order to build that, right? And there's a there's a cost associated. You mean uh, if you wanted to create yourself a driveway of some kind? That's correct. Yeah. Um, yes, I believe so. Is there any way you can uh, kind of grant something associated with that for those of us that are affected by this? Uh, Tal, do you have an answer for that? What's the, what's the question specifically? Could we uh, put like a permitting exception in so we can just get you know an off street parking set up before this law comes into effect? Oh, I see. Um, we'd have to we'd have to amend the law to put that in there. It's it's possible, um, but I think you. Why wouldn't you just go and get your permit now? Just go to DPW and ask for the curb cut and get it done. If so, we can. Uh... Hey, Amy, could you take the Google Map off? Okay, I was just going to ask if I could stop sharing. Thank you. Um, in regards, a couple of things because we have. Um, a few neighbors here that haven't been following this. Um, it was kind of secondarily brought up about the speed. Um, and then we kind of didn't hear anything more about the safety issues. And Wayne had spoken, that started in August uh, when Gail uh, Lasher brought this topic up and it was only around sa safety. Um, the fire chief and DPW at that time, sometime in October, stated that there was an issue here. Um, and I think Matt's um, request for some kind of uh, consideration of reduction of permitting costs, whatever those might be, is really reasonable. I mean, um, he's our next door neighbor, he has an electric car, it's plugged into his house, whatever. and. Um, it's gonna take some time to get that parking pad or driveway or whatever. Um, and, you know, my, as this has gone on, my, my only concern is that this be handled as far as how much area is considered that it be as discreet as possible. So I appreciate your take on this, Amy, you know, it's because it is tough, you know, and I was certainly, um, influenced by my neighbors up the hill um, when they brought it to the meeting. And um, so it's, you know, if, if, if in fact it was stated as a safety issue, I'm glad that it's just going to be somehow um, as best as possible um, as, I don't know, the, the least amount of negative impact on folks. You know, obviously we have some uh, good neighbors on the corner um, where this is this parking ban down to market is going to obviously impact their parking for their guests as it will for us you know so it is there is that consideration but I think that the safety issue is is paramount and um, you know I it did morph for a minute into speed but that really wasn't the initial proposal so you know, this more discreet approach sounds like it's kind of the best of both worlds, so. Yeah, so I, oh, I was just gonna say, I, I agree with this. I think it's a good compromise because um, I, I do live on North Franklin and I'm next to the red brick house that's being, that was mm -hmm. just referenced. Um, and I do think speed is an issue. I, you know, I appreciate that, uh, that the, that the speed test was conducted, but um, like others have said, you know, people do see these signs and they they do slow down. Um, and I, I just know, and and many of us stated before that speed is a, is a consistent issue, and it hasn't been lately with the with the speed test um, reader. But I think it'll become a real issue again once that's taken down. Um, so I just, I, I do agree. I think this is a, a reasonable compromise that's being proposed. Stephan. Can I, can I just add one thing? Um, I just wanna add that speed on North Franklin is not unique to North Franklin. I mean, even on North Montgomery, we have speeding issues. So I think if we take 
speed out of this for this dis purposes of the parking issue, that would be better and deal with speed in the village in general separately. Agree. Now we've had a couple hands up. So let me, uh, Bob, you had your hand up first. I was going to ask, what's the plan for when we have a snow emergency with alternate side parking? What's going to happen? For, for single side parking, a snow emergency doesn't apply. Is that correct, Al? You stay on the, the single side. Well, yes, I, that's correct. Sorry, I was on mute. Yeah. So, how does that side get plowed? I, I, I should know. I don't. I, that's questions for Wayne, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> that work, Wayne. We, yeah, we oh. had the same issue on Third Street, um, where there was no parking on the other side of the street because it was a fire lane. So, yeah. yeah so that you don't. Handled. You don't do the opposite side parking, right? Correct. Wayne, give Correct. me the second version of how you handle that. What the hell is that? Well, I mean, on the bigger storms, like I said before in the in the past meetings, they would, uh, you know, I push the snow to the one side where there's no cars, so cars aren't buried, and then a, day, a couple of days later, we come through with a snowblower and, re and remove the snow. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> Edward, you were up next. Hi, um, just the parking issue that we're all having down here at the end of the block. We're 43 North Franklin. We're right on the corner. We have a handicap sign out front because my mother-in-law's in, in a wheelchair. Now, when you're having to be one side parking on the other side of the street from 42 down to 44 at the corner, that's going to force their company to park in front of our available space. Yes, we have a driveway, but I can't load my mother-in-law in our car for doctor's appointments and all the necessary stuff that we have to have for emergency personnel in the driveway. It won't work. It doesn't fit like that. So now am I going to have to worry about when you have this set up so far up the block about how much I'm going to have to worry about my parking situation at the end of the corner with my mother-in-law? Nobody brought that up. I think it's still illegal to park in a handicap marked spot. But they, do it anyway. but they do anyway. Then you should know. I mean, I've called a couple of times. I've been polite. I've asked people not to park and block my handicap because of my mother in law's issues. They still do. People have yard sales. People park in front of my house, block the handicap, go across the street or wherever they're going to yard sale. Um, it's the reason why I have posted signs in the yard because it's that people don't respect property and spots anymore. Hmm. Parking in a handicap is a police issue that we can right. we can highlight to them and make sure we get that addressed. All right, thank you. Have you uh, Josh, um, I, I wanted to say a couple of things. One uh, to Matt's comment about getting a permit uh, to put in a driveway. I believe that actually you don't need a, a permit. You just you need a curb cut approval, which you bring to the uh, to the board, the village board, not to the planning board. So the village board would presumably, uh, the village board will be aware of this new law. And if someone comes and asks for a curb cut, uh, that would be approved, uh, presumably um, all other things being uh, equal. And um, there wouldn't need to be approval of plans or, or anything else. The second thing that I was going to say was, um, uh, in terms of timing, the law could include in it uh, temporary permits for six months at a time for people who could demonstrate a hardship uh, as a result of this new law. So that um, somebody who says, well, it's going to take me, oh, everybody's shaking their heads, no. Okay. Well, I was just going to say, if somebody says it's going to take me three months to, to get a, 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 you know, I have to get the village board to approve my curb cut, then I have to get quotes for a driveway, then I have to get the driveway installed. Where am I going to park my car uh, between now and then? Uh, the, 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 I'm seeing people shaking their heads. No, but I'll just finish this thought, which is that the board could uh, grandfather in uh, for temporary short-term periods of time, people for whom this would be a hardship and then they would have to renew each time. And if mm -hmm. you uh, didn't get uh, your driveway done in the time you said it would, then you wouldn't be able to renew. Okay. 
done. We have a municipal parking lot that someone could park in until they have a, a driveway or whatever they're going to put in. I think if we if we are able to agree on the area, I lost my Google, I accidentally closed my Google Earth, um, as beginning on the south side of 38, yep. mm -hmm. then we don't have a driveway issue because 42 and 44 both have off street parking. And that really is the most problematic area. I mean, in front of 38 is, is, is iffy, but the real problem is down at the very end of that block. It's super narrow. I don't know. What do you think? Amy, yeah. um, are you talking just, I'm getting a little turned around. I'm sorry, um, north side. So yeah, I got, yeah. So I know what side, are you saying, I'm just not quite sure where, what line of demarcation you're talking about. Let's, let's think in terms of, we have our driveway at 42, yeah. right? And then there's a little bit of property between, uh, that's Matt's um, next to us. Are you saying kind of starting at our driveway? I'm just a little confused. I was that thinking, last part. well, um, I, that's, thank you. I was gonna ask if the property was belonged to 38 or 42. Um, yeah, 38 runs to the beginning of our driveway. Yeah. Um, just trying to make it so that we, address the safety issue and inconvenience the least amount of people. Except mm -hmm. Wayne, Wayne, when you put up that Google uh, mm -hmm. Earth, Wayne pointed to the white car that was across from the Southern property line mm -hmm. of 38, mm -hmm. not the Northern property line. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I believe uh, Mr. Rosales, who I think lives at 38, I've heard say, has an electric vehicle that is parked mm -hmm. in the street mm -hmm. and we don't have our electric vehicle charging stations yet installed in the municipal parking lot. So I'm just wondering where Mr. Rosales would park if this took effect in two weeks and he didn't have time to get a driveway in which I think I heard Mr. Rosales say he's actually willing to do, but he would yeah. yeah. Sorry to cut you off. Yes, we we uh, we do. I just need to get our fuel tank removed also, so it's not just as simple permitting. I think is a is a curb cut, but. Um. Well, not to overcomplicate it. You know, I understand Matt's situation, and given that um, he has an intention to take care of all that, and it won't happen overnight um that you know there be some this is where i stop shaking my head at you josh um because there has to be a little buffer on that um because matthew is in effect moving to maybe this wasn't his timetable but now he would be moving forward on getting that driveway so i think it's a reasonable request to get at a discrete overarchingly agreed upon area you know, but I think there's going to have to be some realistic accommodation for Matthew to get whatever work he needs to get done. That's what I'm trying to figure out here, and I'm not being successful. Uh, is if I could measure right because where it narrows okay. is where the road narrows is kind of north end of the building of 38 or south end of the building of 37 is where it narrows. So if we could do it where it's you know, 427 feet south of Market Street or something like that, uh, to be just very specific about where it is, because directly in front of 38, the, it's, it's just to the north side of 38 where the street narrows, it's fairly visible from Google Maps. So that's our primary area of focus. I'm just trying to figure out how to define it. Mm -hmm. I think number of a feet is a very good way to do that. If I could figure out how to do that on Google Maps, I would. I, I, you know, there are these there are these little things that you push. Yeah, yeah you have to get one of those uh, round circle uh, thingies. Yeah. Measuring <laughs> wheel. Uh, 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 what's that, Rob? Me measuring wheel. Yeah, oh, measuring yeah. wheel. Yeah. You just start at the corner of uh, of uh, um, Market. Market. Franklin Market. Street and, and Market Street, the southwest corner. And you just roll down to where you know they start being wide enough. 
It's pretty clear. I mean, yes, that's the most accurate way to do it. However, if you stand in the middle of the street, you can <laughs> see very clearly where the narrowest part of the street is. I think we're all agreed where the narrowest part of the street is. I think it's a matter of giving Matt a little bit of time to do what was his plan anyway. In regards to the amount of parking on both sides of the street that creates the level of narrowness that we're experiencing and that our fire department and our DFW have identified as being dangerous, that's what exists closer to Market Street. Um, you know, that's not, that's, that's a current issue. So in my opinion, the law should be put in effect. Um, Matt should not get a ticket for his electric car. I think there should be a reasonable understanding that he's moving in that direction and that he's an honorable person um, and he's gonna do it. And um, I don't know how you do this legally. I'm just talking as a neighbor, so. The way you do it legally is you, you adopt the law, but instead of saying in section four, this local law shall take effect immediately upon filing, you change that to this local law shall take effect six months from the date of adoption. I really think that six months is way too long. We, uh, those well, of us that I, have been I, living on that yeah. side of the street have been waiting a long time for this. This has already been going on for seven months without anything happening whatsoever. And again, if we could just have a discreet surgical approach to this, measure, get the little wheelie thing, do the measuring and have an understanding. It's, you know, that in this period of X period of time that Matthew will have this dispensation and move forward on this. Okay. Waiting another six months is, I'm not getting the rationale. The bottom line I'm is open to hearing it, but I'm not getting it yet. Yeah, we're in agreement with that. Um, we're Wait another two weeks because this is a significant change to the way the law is currently written. So we'll need to rewrite it, come back to a public hearing in two weeks. By then we can take it, take the measurement and get it exactly where we want it, where we're discussing, which I think I've got captured on my screen and come back and close this out in two weeks. And uh, tell wh why couldn't you also put a provision in the law that says that uh, any homeowner affected by this or property owner affected by this um, uh, could can request a temporary uh, exemption not to exceed. Uh, well, that allows Matt to come in and request an exemption uh, for two months or three months. Uh, I, I mean, the, the other way, I think I'm hearing Jane and Maria, you say just like, uh, you know, honor, like just don't ticket him or something, but I, I, it's, help, it's difficult to have like a verbal understanding that you're gonna not do something when you could enshrine it, you know, in the law itself. Right, and I, I'm, I don't think I'm talking about just a handshake and a wink on that. Um, I'm open to whatever would accommodate Matt, period. Well, you know, however I'm, that would be most That's what I'm efficient. suggesting, that the law yeah. allow for an, a temporary uh, exception for uh, someone who, for whom this would be a hardship. Here's my again, thing. again, the area of hardship is where what I'm is the pebble I'm tripping over. If we have a very specific issue like Matthew is bringing to the board, I totally get that. Um, I just what I'm seeing now is that in two weeks, are we going to have a public hearing that in effect is going to again start this start the clock again? And I am concerned about that. We're required to because we're making a significant change to what's in the law. Sure, but we had a public he hearing, Mr. Mayor, where the officials came and said we had a safety issue. It was not anyone's doing that it, it just languished and became a speed issue, which is a town village wide issue. So I'm just, I'm just citing my concern that, you know, I don't want to start the clock again on this. And I think we are all perfectly able to come together and figure out a way to, you know, however you want to put it, you know, hardship, whatever, the impact, the obvious the impact. The way to do it is where I, when I look at this and where the street narrows, I see it being 
on the north side of 38, which alleviates the problem. If we measure it down to that spot, which would be the north side of 38's house, not property, but house, that appears to me where it narrows, at least on Google Maps. That kills two birds with one stone, so to speak, and allows us to get this done at the next meeting. That works. That that works for me because that's where we're parked right now is in front of our house, not in front of that yard. Right. And I really like, appreciate that suggestion. I, I think that works for us as well. Yeah. So that that looks to me like where it narrows <laughs> uh, is right at right at the yard there, Matt. Yeah, I would I would like to request being the property owner of 38 North Franklin. I mean, sorry, 36. I live at 36. I own 36, not 38. Um, that it be considered just on the property line, I guess, between our two properties, because I do think that's actually where it starts to narrow. Um, but uh, anyway, I just. Stefan, you know, one thing to address this is if DPW goes out with a measuring wheel, they put a little orange marker in the road uh, where the proposed boundary is so everyone can see it. Okay. I think that's a fair, that's a fair uh, request. A little spray paint there or something. Okay. Wayne, you got that? We'll, we'll go out uh, one day, one afternoon this week. And All right, I'll let Anthony know. We have, the, we have the roller thing? Yes, we do. We have a few of them. Yeah. All right, very good. Any other comments on that? So, Don, let's put that as a uh, public hearing at the next Village Board meeting. Let's make sure we get it out in the news and everything. That'll be April 14th. Any other comments on the uh, parking lot? Let me get myself put back in place here. Bear with me. Okay, moving on. Uh, lawn mowing bids are in. We got two bids. Let me find it. Okay, so we got a bid from Flats Brothers, who are the uh, company that we're currently using. They did uh, provide all of the requests that were requested in the bid, and they came out for 24 cuts, 24 weeks of cutting at 23,880, which is comparable to where they are this year. The second bid that we got is called Shortcut Lawn Care. They failed to provide references, and I apologize, I don't have the email. They failed to provide one more item as well, a list of equipment. They came in, now they quoted a 15 week with 15 mows and a 24 mows, but from a standpoint of an apples to apples comparison, and since 24 weeks was the request of the bid, their request at 24 mows comes in at 28,752. So again, uh, Flats Brothers, 23,880, shortcut, 28,752. Stefan? On the board? Um, I have a question about, we added in the option. So is that accounted for? We have a cost per mo. So okay. what we asked them to do is bid on a standard 24 week, and then we'd get charged that cost per mo uh, if we went beyond that. Yeah, I mean, for the multiple years, like if we opted, what, remember we, sp we spoke about um, being able to opt in for another year off of this bid so we don't have to do this process every year. I don't have the bid in front of me. Okay. Don, do you recall if we put that in? I think it was for two, every two years, right? Yeah, right. I, asked for, I just, I can't confirm that that's actually what went out in the bid. Okay. Well, I thought Flats Brothers did an excellent job this year. I really did. Every time I would go to the park with the dog and I'd think, oh, it's about time to get mowed. Show up later in the day, it was mowed. So I think they did good. Yeah, I agree. They did good. Okay. 
Would anyone like to make a proposal to accept Flats Brothers bid for lawn mowing? Oh. I will. Oh. Right. Rob first. I'll second it. Give me second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? So carries. Um, so one thing that didn't make it on uh, is a resolution. Bear with me a second. Let me pull it up so I get the wording right. So last week we reviewed the New York State Police Reform and Reinvention Collaborative, uh, Athens uh, Policing Committee Implementation Plan. Uh, we had no recommended changes to that. Would anyone make willing to make a motion to approve the Village of Athens Police Committee Implementation Plan as presented? I'll offer that. That would be Gail. Second. Hub second. second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Sorry, Amy. That's okay. <laughs> I think my internet's faster. <laughs> <laughs> Any opposed? So carries. Thank you. Um, any comments, questions, or concerns on minutes? No. I don't want to make a motion to approve the minutes from March 10th. I make a motion. <laughs> waiting for you, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carries. Have we reviewed the vouchers? Are there any concerns or questions on the vouchers? Nope. nope. Would anyone like to make a motion to approve the vouchers as presented in the abstracts? Come on, Gail. <laughs> I'll offer that. <laughs> I'll second it. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? So carries. Um, okay, so next is the proposed resolution approving local law number two. I believe we left from a public standpoint public hearing standpoint at a position where we're ready to approve it with the addition of the arts and uh, education, the addition of light in, in industry or industrial <coughs> and the definition as written in industrial. We're not including the should shall argument in section D, I think. Any other comments from the board on that? No. We've got some procedural things. Um, did we do the secret on that at the last meeting? Yes. I know we had the documents available. I don't recall if we actually ran through them and made the negative declaration. Do you have it handy, Tell? I can pull it up real quick, yeah. Uh, yeah, I saw the documents. I'm not sure we went through it because we did tabled it. Make the negative declaration. Why can't I find it now? I'll look as well. Okay, here we go. That's part one. Okay, yeah, and here's part two. Um, do you want me to run through it? Yeah, go ahead, just very okay. Um, I'll, I'll offer a no response um, to all of these questions, but if anybody wants to make um, an argument or even just have a discussion, just let me know. We'll stop and talk about it. Um, by saying no or small impact, um, we're saying that we do not believe that there will be that substantial of an impact as, on, on these aspects. So number one, will the proposed action create a material conflict with an adopted land use plan or zoning regulation? I would say no, because it's consistent with the comp plan. Um, number two, will the proposed action result in a change in the use or intensity of use in the land? No. Will the proposed action impair the character or quality of the existing community? No. 
Will the proposed action have an impact on the established on the environmental characteristics that cause the establishment of a critical environmental area? No. Will the proposed action result in an adverse change in the existing level of traffic or affect existing infrastructure for mass transit, biking, or walkway? No. Um, will the proposed action cause an increase in the use of energy and it fails to incorporate reasonably available energy conservation or renewable energy opportunities? No. Number seven, will the proposed action impact existing A, public or private water supplies or B, public or private wastewater treatment utilities? No. Number eight, will the proposed action impair the character or quality of important historic, archeological, architectural or aesthetic resources? No. Number nine, will the proposed action result in an adverse change to natural resource, resources such as wetlands, water bodies, groundwater, air quality, flora, and fauna? No. Will the proposed action result in an increase in the potential for erosion, flooding, or drainage problems? No. And the last one, will the proposed action create a hazard to environmental resources or human health? No. So then having answered no to all of those, we would then make a motion to adopt a negative declaration, which means that we are finding that there will not be a substantial negative uh, impact to the environment as a result of the adoption of this law. Okay. Would anyone like to make a motion to approve, to, to forward a negative uh, seeker response? I will. Amy. I'll second it. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So carry. And then right. the other procedural aspect of, the, of that is we did make a referral to the county planning board because this is a modification of our adopted zoning law. They did send back after it was on their agenda and they reviewed it and um, without fanfare um, suggested and, and requested that we adopt it. Can, can I ask who just seconded the secra? I, me, Rob. Rob, okay, thank you. Excellent. Okay, so we don't need any motion or resolution regarding the county planning board, Bill. That's correct, they, they, they recommended approval. Okay, so with that, uh, would anyone like to make a motion to approve local law number two, amending the zoning law concerning mixed use waterfront district? I will. Amy. I'll second. Gail seconds. All in favor? Aye. Anyone opposed? So carries. Uh, do we need a seeker? We don't need a seeker for the uh, special use permit uh, removal, right? No. No. No, other, no other requirements for that. Okay. Um, so the next will be approval of local law number three, repealing the temporary six month moratorium on special use permits. Uh, for mixed-use waterfront district. Any comments or concerns, questions from the board on that? Okay. Would anyone like to make a motion to approve local law number three? I'll offer it. Bob? I'll second. Amy seconds. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So carries. All right. Uh, correspondence. Let's see here. The first two. Let's go through a little bit. So the first is. There's number one. There it is. Sorry, guys. Okay. Yes. The first is the. Um, let's see here. Trooper David Brinkerhoff Memorial Race Series, uh, which did not occur last year, but they do want to do it this year. This is the bike race starts at uh, Kutsaki Athens High, comes down through Athens circles around and goes back up to Kuksaki. Um, we traditionally support that each year. The request is for police support to close roads, uh, which we have traditionally done. So Gail, I'll, unless you have an objection or an issue with that, I'll let you forward that to the police uh, for support. What, what was the date of that? I'm sorry. It is June 5th and June 19th. June 5th and 19th? Yep. Sorry, I'm reading the COVID restrictions here. Thank yes, you. Yes, there's a couple pages. June 5th to 19th, yep. Thank you. All right. Uh, 
let's see here. So police support, they do have a uh, COVID-19 plan. Uh, talks about social distancing, staging areas, how they start, uh, relatively comprehensive. Uh, and I think it covers everything it needs to cover. Any questions from the board? Do we need a, do we need to pass a resolution tell? Do we normally do that to provide police support for this? You're here, you may as well do it, doesn't hurt. Gail, you okay with that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Would anyone like to make a motion to provide police support to the uh, Capital Race, Capital Bicycle Racing Club for the Trooper David Brinker Hofford Memorial Race Series? I will. Ricky? I'll second. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Next correspondence is Town of Athens Planning Board. This is one uh, that some folks may have an interest in. Uh, this is the addition of a 10,000 ton tank at the Peckham facility out on Schoharie Turnpike. The planning board meeting is tomorrow uh, at 7 p.m. I did put it on our village calendar, just okay. as a reminder. Okay. Next two are Hecate. Uh, the first is simply that with no public comment, they release their environmental compa compatibility and public need. Uh, and then finally is a, a signature page. I'm not exactly sure what this one is. It simply said, states that a signature page is hereby amended. So, uh, everyone has those. New business, tentative budget. Uh, I don't, Emmy, do we have, we were missing police, I believe. Do we have the police budget in yet? Proposed, yeah. the proposed budget? Okay. Amy and I will take a chop at it this week um, and make sure we've got it relatively close to balance. We'll do it. We'll, I'll set it up like I have traditionally where I'll highlight any major changes. Uh, Amy and I will go through and come up with kind of a set of recommendations against those major changes, show uh, you know, a couple of options to get ourselves balanced based on where we stand when we start uh, <coughs> the next village board to adopt uh, that, that budget. Okay. But, so Amy and I'll do some work this week uh, and this weekend to get ourselves set up so that the next board is, is, has an executable plan. Stefan, can I just ask a couple questions? Of course you can. Um, are you going to keep the code enforcement line in the police department line? I think we should have them separate so we know what is being spent by code enforcement versus police department. Uh, I'll have to sit and talk to MJ about how we separate that. Okay, and then the school resource officer? Be able to do it like a line item, like the, uh, the resource officer. But we don't ever fill anything in there. How do you mean? All right, so if I go to salaries, school resource officer, we have uh, 26,000 in the budget. Right. And nothing was spent all year. And then if you come, come down to, you know, where we get the money back from, there's nothing entered in that line. Right. Okay. Yeah, generally we use the school resource officer to backfill salaries, right? So we reapply it to the policing budget to backfill the salaries. So we view the salary line as whatever's in the salary line for the police budget plus the 26,000 in the code enforcement budget. Uh, sorry, in the resource officer budget. We should, uh, that's how I would view doing the code enforcement as well as an augmentation to the police salary line. But wouldn't we like to know what we spend on the on the school resource thing so we know if we should be renegotiating with the school or no? It should be traceable based on the hours that he files. He has to he has to put in his hours as a resource. Right. That's all on the on the timesheet. Okay. So we should have traceability to that and we'll have the same for code enforcement. All right, so who's going to trace that is, I guess, what I'm asking. I don't know. I'll, I'll have to sit with MJ and figure out how she wants to do that. I mean, you're right. It's all on the timesheet. It shouldn't be difficult. 
the the code enforcement is directly off the timesheet. Right? Every every hour that uh, Russo and Tercasio clock is a dollar against uh, against the uh, code enforcement budget. I thought that you said that, that that increased no matter where which area they were working. It does. So it's every hour that they clock as an officer is a dollar against the code enforcement budget. Two dollars once they're fully trained. But you don't have anything in the code enforcement salaries for the next budget. We'll have to add something. Okay. Right now it's probably in the police budget, but we can take it out and add it into the code enforcement budget. But I'm not, I haven't looked at that in detail yet. Gail, okay. Okay. Anything else on the budget before Amy and I get into it this week? Yeah, I'd look pretty good to me. You know, we still have money left over. And it would look pretty good the way it was intended the budget. We got to get the um, the inputs from Bank of Green County. Uh, I expect this year it to be interest only on the DPW building, so it shouldn't be a major impact. Um, and then. Uh, you know, we need to look at all the reserves, et cetera, uh, make sure that we've got uh, the reserves fully funded appropriately. So I don't, uh, you know, I don't expect there to be excess, but I don't expect us to have a significant impact based on the interest only this year for the DPW building. Any other comments on the tentative budget? All right, DPW Garage closeout is next. Let me find that email. There it is. Okay. Original bid amount was $1,040,000. We then had another $40,000 of alternates. Uh, sorry, that was against that 140. So there's the original budget, original bid was 1.04 million, 1 million and 40,000. 40,000 of that were alternates, which we removed, one being the generator. Uh, and I apologize, I don't remember what the other was. Um, at any rate, we took those off, um, bringing the total value of the contract to $1,431,000. Then with change orders, and I've got all the details here. If you have questions, I'm, I'm not going to read all the change orders to you, but if you have questions, I'm happy to go into it. Uh, I think we all got it in an email. Um, we had a total of 70,000, roughly $70,300 uh, worth of change orders uh, across the various contractors. Uh, a significant portion of that was the addition of the um, radiant heat in the flooring uh, was a large part of that. Um, those are the big ones. So the total value of the EPW garage comes to $1,070,751. Okay. So that's well within what we had uh, budgeted for with Bank of Green County for the bond. We had a little bit of buffer in there and we're not coming anywhere near using that buffer. So we did a pretty good job of making trade-offs to get what we wanted by taking some of the, the deductions off, putting some of the change orders on. I think we got exactly what we wanted. There are a couple of items still to be decided. Um, first are ceiling fans for the truck bay. This is a total of $4,155 requested to put ceiling fans in. Uh, the benefit of the ceiling fans is uh, all the heat rises. So in the winter, it theoretically lowers heating costs by blowing that heat back down to the floor. Uh, and uh, that's the primary reason to do it. So it would, uh, it would help to reduce heating costs and keep the heat blown down to the floor. A uh, total of $4,155 uh, would be an additional change order. The next is gutters which are not uh, included in the current um, bid. This is another one we could ask the general contractor to do. No, I don't think so, hold on a sec. The general contractor doesn't want to do this one. So we'd have to go out and bid this. Uh, we, the exp expected cost is four to $5,000 for gutters on the building. These snow cuts, I forget what they're called. There's, there are 
for those who were out at the um, at the open house, snow was falling off the building on people uh, because they hadn't got the snow blocks up in time for the snow. Those I believe are up now. Uh, that's not part of the gutter cost. Those are included. So the gutters are, are standard rain gutters that would go around the building. So we'd need to go out and bid that. The, uh, the ceiling fans would be done by the current electrical contractor. So that cost is known at 4,155. Finally, uh, there is a small landscaping plan that includes a little green space in front of the building and a few trees uh, to block the um, where the fuel tank is uh, and to block some of the uh, light pollution, uh, fairly small. Uh, and uh, that's another one to go out to bid on. So what I'd like to request now is approval to go out to bid or a, a, a motion to go out to bid for the gutters and for the landscaping. I'll offer it. Rob? I'll, I'll second. second. Oh, go ahead, Gail. We'll give it yeah, you me. got fried dick, Gail. Uh huh, Rick. <laughs> Gail, as a <laughs> all in favor? Aye. Opposed? Bill carries. Um, okay, that's that. Sorry, let me go back and find my. Uh, that's all we've got on the agenda. We'll go around the room, starting with Amy. Um, good. I have a quick question about the DPW building and finishing it off and everything. Um, yep. Anthony mentioned that the paving of the parking lot was not in the original because they figured that they could do it um, cheaper, I guess. Can we... <laughs> Can we get that in on this particular bond or? Uh, no, what, what Jason said is, uh, I think that's what you're referring to as the meeting we had with Jason. Um, yeah, actually, and I just ran into Anthony before that meeting and he, he had mentioned that, um, you know, the, the paving wasn't part of the original plan, so. We had never, pla we had never planned to pave. Of the $40,000, and thank you for reminding me, the deductions that we took off, one, one was the HVAC, which was 17,000. The other 23 was to do the stone, the gravel work ourselves, which we did. So we, had never, we had never planned to pave. We kind of said we'd kick that down the road uh, and look to do that at a later time. If it's something the, the board is interested in doing, we could certainly go out and get bids and see what it costs and then make a determination from there. So we could add that uh, and look to go out and get bids to do it. Um, that is, I'll have to go back and look at where we're bonding. I think we've got a little over $100,000 um, of buffer remaining in the bond. Yeah. Uh, not sure what paving would cost. We could certainly go out to uh, Wayne. Wayne. All right, so Anthony did have uh, Calarusa come over and give us a quote. And with the, with the prices now, it's, I believe it was 65,000 and that's with the price of oil now. And you know, the oil's going up. <clears throat> this is one we had deliberately decided not to do originally. Mm -hmm. So, so, do we just put it off? It's up to you guys. We, uh, my recommendation at this point is to put it off just because it wasn't in the plan. Uh, you know, I, I, you know, I have a maybe a little uh, OCD as far as I want to come in as close to budget as I can. Um, but if it's if it's something we want to discuss, we could go out to bid on it and make a decision from there. <laughs> what do you think? I don't think it'll, what what do you think? I don't think it'll hurt to put it out to bed, I right? guess. Let's yeah. find out. Then it then it'll all be done. I agree. I agree. Would anyone like to make a motion to go out to bid for paving of the DPW build uh DPW lot? I'll make a motion. Ricky? I'll second it. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Bill carries. 
Okay, any other questions on the DPW? Or nope. actually, we were, we were up to you, Amy, so. You can keep oh, okay. Um, not a lot. Um, I'd already did the paving, yay. Um, the hole in the old cemetery. Um, Wayne, I spoke to Anthony and uh, he said you guys can do that. It's already done. Oh, okay, good. I haven't been over there. I took, I took care of it Monday. Okay, great. Monday or two, yeah, Monday I, I took care of it. For anyone that doesn't know, one of the old graves caved in because the old uh, coffins were just made out of like pine and eventually they give way. So there was a sinkhole and we were worried somebody might fall in or a ghost might get out or something. Mm. Um, and then the park signs are in with the dog waste bags. Um, and I just wanted to talk about placement because obvious, the, the, the obvious spot is, you know, upon the entry uh, where there used to be the no dogs allowed sign um, to put the rules and the, and the bag dispenser there. My other thought was because there's, you know, rules of conduct to put it at the other entry, but that's not a great place to put the bags. Um, so I just wanted to see if anyone had any input or if I should just figure it out. <laughs> what, what's not a great place, Amy? The other side, the entry that's over by the band shell, yeah. uh, by the gazebo, it's not a great place for the bags. It's a fine place for a sign that says, please don't park your car in here and, and drink and spend the night camping. But for the uh, dog waste bags, it's not a great placement because it's sort of, you won't, you won't notice it once you're in the park. So my thought was either to put um, the second thing of bags on its own someplace, maybe over towards where the water is. Um, I don't want it to be obtrusive, but it's a good place for people to grab them and see that it's there if they don't have a bag with them. So it would be a third post is the only difference and possibly another little sign that just says clean up. Maybe over by that big anchor. Yeah. That might be a good place too. But they always walk around the bandstand. Yeah. That's my my guy likes to go that way. <laughs> the front of the bandstand, Amy, uh, where the ramp is closer to the, if we're going to put another post in, I, I guess my thought is they should be at the entrance, you know, as close to the entrance as you can. So yeah, the signs, absolutely. But I'm afraid that the second thing of bags will just be lost over by that side entrance by the... Even if it's by the bandstand there? Maybe. Well, you know what, I'll give it some more thought and... I, I'm willing to defer to Amy's judgment. <laughs> I guess we could always pull them back out and move them if everybody hates where yep, they are. That part's true. <laughs> okay, I'll figure it out. I'll figure it out. I know where one of them goes. I'll figure the rest out. I'll talk to Anthony and Wayne and see where they think is a good spot to put them to. Looking forward to it. I've, I've turned around more than once because I didn't have them on me. That's why they're always on me. Keep them in all your pockets. I, I pull it out, but it looks nice with my outfit. <laughs> nice pocket square, yes. <laughs> all right. Um, that's pretty much all. We talked about everything else I had to talk about. Okay. Ricky? Uh, yeah, I got a phone call last week from uh, Noel Payson. He's retiring. Okay, great. So him and his our new insurance agency came and I did put $1 million coverage on the new DPW building. Okay. Is that enough? That's that's about what you want? That's about, that's a replacement cost? Is that what they're talking about? Now there's a $70,000 replacement cost too for the inside. This is just for the building itself, a million dollar coverage. That's what I meant, a seventy a million dollar replacement cost for the building. Yes. That's, that's probably about right. That's about right. And uh, he wanted uh, Dawn and MJ are sending all this stuff to him, like the old vehicles we just got rid of. They all got to go to him. I took the old building off and well, I'm almost done with it. Great. Thank you, Ricky. Okay. Stefan, can I ask a question about the insurance? Very quickly. Does it have a uh, inflation provision? 
because it sounds like the village just spent a million dollars and it's a million dollars of coverage, but next year to replace it would be a million fifty thousand, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, it's kind of important yeah. to know if the policy has an inflation provision. Just that I couldn't tell you because we're not really done with it yet. It's not complete. So I couldn't really tell you. Most of them do. Just something to keep in mind. When it when it's finalized, then I'll know, and then you'll know. Thank you so much, Ricky. Okay. What else you got, Ricky? Where's the one else you got? You have anything else, Ricky? No, that's it. Uh, Anthony's going to start doing the leaks tomorrow. He's going to start them. Great. Very good. And uh, everything pretty good with the water and sewer, I guess. Okay. They're going to start at the sewer plant tomorrow morning. And I'll be there. That's Take it from there. Great. Thank you, Ricky. Gail? Okay. Yeah, I have a couple things. Um, the police department union uh, with Ed's retirement will be sending all the paperwork to the village and it's very, very time sensitive. So most of the cor correspondence actually will be through email, phone call or fax, but it has to be answered right at that time in order for things to go through. Um, do you want to put a point person on that as soon as things are received? Like Ed said, you could call him as soon as it's received so he can make sure that it, you know, if they need anything to get it in. So you and I as point uh, on that initially, Gail. Yeah. And and Dawn, just make sure you and MJ know that's a that's a text, not an email, if you get something from that. It'll be a text or an email. Text well, email as well, but make sure you text Gail and I if you get something from Inzi's okay. office. Okay. Good. That way we get it that day. Gail may be yep. Gail may be faster at emails than I am, but uh, so I do have a phone call. To, I've been playing phone tag with Inzi's office. They finally called me back. No, they called the village office back. Uh, so now I've got a number to call. So we'll we'll see if we can lay out what that plan looks like. Okay. Okay. Next. Um... I know two, two houses down, they, their garage um, comes out at the end of the alleyway here. They were wondering if they could put a cement pad there so that they can get into their garage without having mud all over. They take care of that area right now. What are the rules? Is that be in the alleyway or is it on their property? Well, it's it's partially into the alleyway and partially on their property. Wayne, we do plow the alleys, and as we plow, that piece of cement is going to get higher and higher relative to the alleyway. Is my concern. They they actually snow blow that that area in front of their garage. Yeah, my only concern is if it's jutting out into the alley, whether it's going to obstruct the plows. Know, or, or the plows are going to damage it, and we're going to wind up with trouble there. So, I, if Wayne, it's on the property, I don't have a problem. Go ahead, Wayne. Would that affect it at all? I don't. Uh, it does depend on how high. Um, the only other thing we could do is once they do pour a concrete pad, we come in with some blacktop and taper it away so the plows wouldn't catch it. But if the plow does go go across and scrape it. You know, puts a couple lines in it. You know, are they going to hold us uh, liable? <clears throat> do you do you actually plow right up to that telephone pole right there? Yes. Yep. Gail, where is this? I didn't. I didn't hear. Um, back behind Larry and Bruce's house. Okay. I think my feedback would be to have them sort out how to keep it on their property. Okay, and um, the lease for Crossroads, um, have we worked on that at all for the street yeah. there? We met, uh, Amy and I, Tal, uh, met with uh, Kenny and Sandy. Uh, 
we've got a, a plan for how we're going to do it. I think uh, I don't have it written up yet, uh, but Amy will have Amy will be prepared to propose that. What what I will do over the course of the next week, with with Amy's blessing, uh, is a, a, an executive order, which will allow for this year to do the same as we did last year with COVID. Uh, so that covers them this year, and then we're talking about uh, a law allowing for how businesses apply for and get permitted for uh, sidewalk and, and potentially street use. And um, the EJA 5K, where do we stand on that? I never got a response back on COVID protocols. From, from that group that's putting it on? Yeah, it never, their, their proposal didn't include any COVID protocols at all. Okay, I will uh, let them know they have to resubmit that then. Yes, and then I do have one other concern with, with the electric car. That cord is crossing the sidewalk. I had that thought too. In. It sounds like I mean, he's no. really looking to correct that. Okay, I just want to make sure. It is. I had that thought too. That's all I have. Rob, you got anything? I got uh, several things. Um, the first thing is uh, cleanup day for the town and village is on Saturday, April 24th from 8 to 12 noon. Uh, they're not taking no more tires because uh, it got out of control and uh, People were dumping 30 tires off and they were probably getting paid to dispose of them and the, then the town and village would have to incur the cost to get rid of them. So they're not accepting no more tires. Um, the brush pile will be closed from April 5th to the 26th. There's no more room down there. Uh, the chipping from Van Etten excavating <clears throat> uh, the, for the brush pile is five thousand five hundred dollars half of that the town will pay anthony already talked to uh rob butler and um he's okay with paying um the uh half the two thousand two hundred and fifty dollars uh hydro flushing will be the week of april 5th through the 8th um and then uh Hold on a second here, sorry. Oh, they're, they're, the DPW crew is starting uh, their 10 hour work days, Monday through Thursday on April 6th, uh, 6 a.m. to 4 p.m. Uh, that's in their contract. And then uh, the youth recreation director, regretfully, um, she is not gonna be returning this year. Uh, she notified the clerk's office. Uh, she will not be coming back. Uh, this year. So the incoming board will have to uh, scout out around for a new director, uh, put it out, advertise it, and then conduct uh, job interviews for that. Uh, Sally, she will be missed. She did an excellent job for the last few years. Um, and then finally, uh, as we all know, this is my final meeting for the village board. Um, I just want to say it's been an honor working with you all for the last two years. I'm happy with what we got done for the last two years uh, through a pandemic and uh, other obstacles, uh, archaeological test digs and quarantine work crews. We still got a DPW building built, and I commend you for being a great team and accomplishing that. I'll be forever proud to be a part of that uh, project. Uh, thank you to Amy for stepping up and carrying a torch for us. Um, and also, uh, I just wish the village the best success. Uh, we welcome the incoming board, um, Josh and Nancy. Josh will be returning back on the board and uh, I welcome Nancy back on the board and I wish the best success for the incoming board. And uh, I certainly hope that I met everyone's expectations um, and certainly did my best for everybody on 
And all I can say is um, uh, goodbye and we'll see you around town, I guess. So. Thanks, Rob. Thank you, Rob. Thank you. Good job. You're welcome. Good job, Rob. Well, that's why I should go first. <laughs> So uh, yeah, I have I have no new business to bring up. I just wanted to uh, first congratulate uh, Nancy and Josh uh, and Amy uh, for their uh, for their wins. Um, but uh, I want to thank this board. I think we've had a good run. I think we've got a lot of stuff done. I very much appreciate the the hard work uh, from everybody that that everyone's put in. I think we've worked very well as a team. Uh, so thank you all very much, Amy. Thank you for stepping up. Rob, you've been a great teammate. I'm sorry to see you go, uh, but thank you for all you've done. Mm -hmm. uh, Gail uh, and, and Amy, thank you. Uh, and uh, best of luck to the new board. So thank you guys very much. I've, I've mostly enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I've got. Thank you again, everybody. Thanks so much. Thank and you. I, thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank Bye. you, guys. Good night, meeting. everyone. Good night. Right. Nice. Oh, we need a motion. Hold on, you don't get off that easy. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Would anyone like to make a motion to adjourn? I'll offer it. Rob? I'll second it. Ricky second. No one wants to adjourn. All in favor? <laughs> Aye. Aye. Opposed? So carries. We're adjourned. Thanks, everybody. Good night, everyone. Good night,